I'm Erica Nesfold, and I will be moderating this Sagan meeting. Uh, the, the conference organizers invited uh, suggestions for, for this particular format in which we have about 90 minutes. Uh, I'm the moderator of a five-person panel who will be uh, addressing the question of who should we send it to on an interstellar mission? If you had a crew of, say, 100 people, which is an arbitrary number I picked, um, how would you decide who to send uh, and, and what are the concerns there? And so I have a fantastic panel that's agreed to be here. The way the Sagan format works is that each of our panelists will give a short talk in response to that question, some of their thoughts and reactions, and then we'll have a panel discussion. I'll have some questions. There'll be some, some conversation. And if we have time at the end, we'll take a couple questions from all of you. Um, so just to introduce myself, I'm American Eswold. I have a PhD in physics from the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. I've done astrophysics research at NASA Goddard and the Carnegie Institute. And then I left academia as a postdoc to join the video game industry, of all things. It turns out there's a lot of overlap between astrophysics simulations that you sell as a video game and astrophysics simulations that you have to write papers about. And uh, in the process of doing that, I, I met a lot of people in the commercial, commercial space industry I uh, was kind of disappointed in their lack of interest in the more ethical and human rights issues to do with space settlement. Um, and so I started working in that direction and talking to a lot of really fascinating experts. Um, so um, I have a book called Off Earth, Ethical Questions and Quandaries for Living in Outer Space. Um, and if you don't feel like buying a book, it's based on a podcast that's free on the internet called Making New Worlds. Um, so I'm going to introduce each panelist uh, as as we go through their talks. Um, so I'll start with Martha Lenio. Um, Dr. Martha Lenio has an undergraduate degree in mechanical engineering at the University of Waterloo and a PhD in photovoltaic engineering at the University of New South Wales in Sydney, Australia. She's worked in the sustainable building industry, research and development for silicon solar cells in Silicon Valley. Thanks for making me say that. Um, as a university lecturer, and she did an eight-month Mars simulation called High Seas, where she was the mission commander, which I hope we'll hear more about today. She's also worked um, as WWF Canada's Arctic Renewable Energy Specialist and is currently a technical manager at High Latitude Energy Consulting. Take it away, Martha. All right. Thank you for that introduction. Um, hi, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm Dr. Martha Lenio. And as you heard, I have a very technical background, mechanical engineering, photovoltaic engineering, working in renewable energy. Um, but I did do this Hawaii space exploration analog and sim simulation um, where I had, yeah, they're very good. It was, it was very interesting. Um, when I went into this mission, I was not super interested on the psychological aspects of space travel. I was much more in, in, interested in the like infrastructure. How are we getting there? How are we building the equipment? Uh, and uh, this, the high seas project was more geared towards how do you pick a crew and support a crew for long duration isolated space missions, more like to Mars. But um, it really opened my eyes to the impact of uh, the crew makeup and the crew psychology and really how that can make or break uh, a mission. With this question, how would we pick a crew for an interstellar mission? I had to kind of imagine what that even would look like in my mind to be able to answer that question. And I was thinking, okay, maybe it'll take a hundred years to get there. Maybe, you know, if with roughly current, I don't know, propulsion technology or something, maybe we need like groups of 10 to come out of cryostasis or something at different points in the mission to make that even feasible to get somewhere where it takes a hundred years to get there. And it's a very technical environment. Um, so what does that mean then for picking a crew? They need to, I think, um, kind of what I learned from the high seas mission is it's really, really critical that people have the same goal, that you're all on the same page, going towards the same, same thing. So, I, and I think with an interstellar mission, one of the big goals is, or things to realize would probably be that it's a one-way mission. 
which makes it very different than maybe other missions that we've done in space today. So the psychological impact of that on the crew um, and how do you how do you pick for that? So I think High Seas did a very good job in our crew selection. Um, and we did like a, a backpacking trip um, just to see, you know, how do people do without communication when everyone's stinky? Uh, what happens if someone's injured? How do you pull together as a team? Can you exhibit like team care and self-care and all of these things to get you through to the end of the mission? Um, so I think things like that is really critical. I think things like doing mission, more missions like the high seas mission as well is really critical um, because people, it was, and that's, that's where it's like, I learned the importance of having that goal and building that trust and putting a lot of work into building that team. So if you're going to be a core team of 10, say really isolated um, out in space for a long time with, and, and with no return, making sure that you really trust your teammates and building that kind of up before the mission even starts. Um, Another thing with a one-year mission too, that's psychological or with a one-way mission that would be psychologically challenging is you will pass away on this, on this journey as will everyone that you know. Um, so it's, um, I mean, that can be challenging, but it can also be, that's a very um, special time to be with someone as well. So I think, you know, more things like palliative care, um, understanding going through that and understanding actually what a special time that can be um, in someone's life journey and being there for that uh, and it's yeah like I'm I'm talking to you today from Iqaluit Nunavut so I live in a you know fairly remote community in northern Canada uh, Baffin Island and you you do see um, quite often the challenges uh, when when things happen in a small community the psychological impact that has on the entire community. So I think making sure that those mental supports are there are actually gonna be really what helps to make um, uh, that kind of a mission successful. So I'm gonna, those were kind of my thoughts and putting together how you would, the consider, considerations you'd have to take into account when creating a crew for this type of mission. You of course need all like the technical abilities and everything, but I think that the psychological ones definitely outweigh um, any other uh, considerations on this type of a mission. Uh, so I'll, I'll turn it over to my other panelists. I think you're gonna have some really interesting perspectives from everyone here today. Um, so I'll, I'll kind of leave it there. <laughs> Thank you very much, Martha. Okay, next up is Aisha Said, also known as Michaela Harris, which you might've seen on the poster for this. Um, Aisha said has worked as an inclusive specialized teacher in Canada, Mexico, Kenya, Macau, and Dubai. As an educator, she's trained teachers and school staff about inclusive practices and has done similar work in the business world through her work in human resources. As the director of human experience at Space for Humanity, Aisha led the Inclusion Council and Citizen Astronaut Program, as well as overseeing internal human resources. Her goal is to ensure that the human experience associated with Space for Humanity is that of community, empowerment, and deep connection to the Space for Humanity mission. Aisha. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much. That's such a great uh, intro. Just going to share my screen here. Okay. All right. So I'm going to talk about finally letting humans go to space and answering this beautiful question. How would you select for a crew for the first interstellar mission? So I first want to focus on finally letting human that first part, because for a large part of our adventures and missions in space, I'm not sure that we've seen representation as humans. I think that it's been very selective and really looking for the best of the best of the best. And now I can understand how that might be, you know, thought of as, as helping to eliminate risk. However, it's also really showing to society, to human, that we're just allowing a very small cross-section. So I want to go into what it means to be finally taking humans to space, a snapshot of our communities, our society, our world, um, of human as a whole. So I want to dig into the big picture before going into that smaller 
selection part. And to do so, I want to talk a little bit about my background, um, which Erica briefly mentioned. So I began my uh, career in inclusive education. And I was really interested in curriculum design, how people are learning and thinking. And that led me into uh, inclusive education. And we looked at absolutely everything from cultural, linguistic, physical, and cognitive differentiation, ultimately so that students in the classroom are able to see equity and justice. So all of a sudden now, we're starting to ask everyone in the room, what are you seeing? What are you feeling? How are you taking everything in? Not just how are you learning? And that's something that I've taken with me when I start looking into selection. So the lessons that I take from, from this experience and working around the world as an inclusive teacher is that we need to put in differentiated supports before we even have that individual enter. So if I was to think of sending 100 people to space for cross-section of the community, I would know that I would have to have supports, differentiated supports. And I would think about how I can do that long before I would even start the interview process, let alone, you know, any other details from that. Something else that I learned was that neurodiversity is the norm. And so, you know, I think that we sometimes really get bogged down, especially with selection. Um, it's absolutely the norm that everyone is just a little bit different, seeing the world, feeling the world, experiencing the world a little bit differently than everyone else. And so to have a really open dialogue so that you can create those supports and they're easy to access for individuals. Um, and that finally human emotion is human. And so, you know what, if you had me up there, there's days I'm going to be frustrated. And I would assume that you wouldn't try and train that out of me. Um, so that's something that I would account for and build into the structure. Um, and even the physical structure around, you know, the vessel that we'll be taking. I also had a stint in human resources, which, you know what, it was an interesting transition. But what I did was I brought in all of those tools and, you know, knowledge of inclusion for kids and brought it to adults, knowing that we've got the exact same needs in that population as well. However, what I didn't realize was that human resources is very rigid and the ultimate gatekeeping place in a company or nonprofit, you name it. Um, and so there were some things that I learned that were really shocking while I was understanding how we make placement decisions and hiring decisions and all of that jazz. So the first thing over and over, people would tell me like, don't rock the boat. It's very easy. Follow this formula for hiring and stick to it. And when they're looking for a new individual or a physician, they've already got someone in mind. Find a new gym. They love gym. Gym is wonderful, but they lost gym somehow. And so find a new gym. So trying to help people understand that we've got to take that away and not have someone in our mind as we're going about the selection. Uh, a culture fit really means just like they're going to work within the power structures that are around them and not challenge them. And Diversity hiring, I could go on and on and on about this, uh, but the viewpoint is really coming from HR and not from discourse in general. Um, and so that can be extremely problematic. So the lessons that I brought out into selection is really, okay, you're going to actually challenge the power structures as you bring in, you know, a lot of different folks into any structure, any community, uh, you name it. So if you're challenging some rigid power structures, who's going to absorb that? Who's going to take it on? And do they have protection in their role and support from higher up? Also, you know, the less opportunities that communities have, you know, when we see only a small um, number of individuals from certain communities, especially those facing barriers to employment, the higher rates of burnout you're going to see, because now it's like, oh, I've got to prove myself. I'm the only person in the room from XYZ community. I've got to go above and beyond. And over and over and over, I was helping support people through active burnout. And as you know, right now, I'm the director of human experience at Space for Humanity. Space for Humanity is a nonprofit out of Colorado that sends individuals, citizens, humans to space. 
So as you know, it's an amazing experience to see the earth from above having the overview effect. And it creates a cognitive shift. Scientists for years came back to earth and were really excited to make change. People that had very, you know, defined missions, scientific missions usually came back with an invigoration to make change. So we thought, what if we sent someone who was already making change in the world and had them have this experience, come back down to earth, do a year long program with us as we track, follow and support them doing impact. So I've been so fortunate to be designing and leading selection for two citizen astronauts that we've taken to space. We're currently in selection now for 2023. Um, and I've also started to redesign. I've actually redesigned and I'm the director of the current 2023 CA program, which has some nuances that we've learned, especially working with those two CAs. So what have I learned from actually helping to create the system to choose people to go to space? Well, you have to really understand what's needed, right? Not make it up, not make assumptions, but really drill down into what a program needs to have someone go through it and have success. What um, a flight provider has, um, you know, requirements so that for sure that individual finds that they are supported and have a positive mission. Um, for Space for Humanity, we also really tie it to this leadership, community development, and impact, what they'll be doing once they return back to Earth. So, you know, looking over all of those different spheres and experiences, looking into selection and the structure of whatever organization or company is going to be looking and selecting, I would say your first thing is looking at duty of care. That was touched on earlier, that psychological piece, making sure that we're not going to push people too far and that we have built in the supports that are required. Um, also understanding and creating plans for changing bias, barriers, power structures. We can just go ahead and assume those exist, um, especially working within the space industry. How do you dismantle them? Who's dismantling them? How are we supporting them? I, like I've talked about, building in those differentiated structures and supports. Um, hiring humans as well who are decision makers. So not the tippity tippity top, but I'm talking more of the heads of department, people who are saying yay or nay, who have your back if you need it. Um, creating a culture where it's okay to be human. Uh, it's okay to openly ask for differentiated supports. And then finally, outside people helping you to choose, create those rubrics. Um, and then also having a team that helps to track those differentiated support. I know the industry right now is really working on bringing out um, percentages and demographic information. But if we're not actually asking people how it's going on the inside, um, it's really hard to get a read on how it's going. So in conclusion, just really embracing the beauty of being human, allowing people to finally be human. Um, but before we bring them on to make sure that we're trying our very best to have a high duty of care and, uh, and support in place. Thank you very much, Aisha. Okay, next up we have Dan Hawk. Dan was born and raised on the Oneida Indian Reservation. He has served as a nuclear reactor operator on U.S. Navy submarines and worked as a senior power, point, power plant operator at UW-Madison and UW-Madison Hospital. Dan is an international committee mem member for the National Space Society, a member of the United Nations Indigenous Community. Um, he's also on a number of indigenous and space panels like the Indigenous Research Center, uh, MIT Space Enabled Group, and Anthropogenic Environmental Impact on Space Traffic. Go ahead, Dan. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here today. Um, what, I, what I wanted to do is I wanted to make a couple of mental notes, and then I wanted to give you an understanding of how, I, how we went about doing a mission on a submarine and how we started that. Um, so I'm, my, my first mental note is that we're looking at a crew of 100 going into interstellar space. Uh, so I, I named that 
NOAA's space arc, right? So that's kind of what we're talking about here is creating a NOAA's uh, space arc as we go about in, into interstellar space. Um, you know, from my, my first thinking about submarines is that we ran out of fresh food within a matter of days. So we talk about, you know, uh, previously here about um, our emotions, right? So you wouldn't believe that, you know, how fresh food would be attached to our emotions while on a long voyage and journey. Um, one of the other things that had on submarines that uh, would need to be considered is our, our medical needs. Uh, there were times where we had people who were sick. We had people who had mental problems that were in severe pain. Uh, we had people who were um, had other types of mental, uh, mental and physical problems, and we even had death. So how we go about treating um, uh, medical patients on long voyages, especially in you know, submarines as an example, and death is another issue that we need to consider. When on a submarine, although, although I was a nuclear reactor operator, I was basically in the engineering spaces. Um, I was an engineer. I was a nuclear reactor operator. Sure. Yes, that's true. But I was also a mechanical operator. I was an electrical operator. And even in the engineering spaces, I had to cross train into operations, right? So what this means is that if you have a hundred people going on an interstellar mission, most of all the people are going to be cross trained into multiple things. Um, a doctor, as an example, will be a dentist, a doctor will be a psychiatrist, a doctor will be a nurse, a doctor will be a medic. Um, so the idea here is that one person would have to do multiple things. Um, so it's just uh, one of those um, things that you have to do and you have to understand in order to, in order to, uh, as we talked about earlier, uh, to all be on the same page for the mission that's at hand, right? Uh, one of the other things that I was thinking about in an ethicist side of uh, ethicist point of view is that our embryos people, our embryos astronauts. So as we go about, we talk yeah. about cryogenic state as an example, putting people in the stasis. But what about um, the future of the rest of the life as we go into interstellar space? So uh, our embryos astronauts. Um, the other thing that we talk about, when we talk about people in a hundred crew mission, are we are we not also talking about, let's say, robots with artificial intelligence to be able to do the job of people? So do we have to have people? And so uh, that question might be that, you know, instead of having uh, 100 human crew, maybe you have 75 human crew and 25 ast astronauts that are actually robots with artificial intelligence. Um, and then the other thing that I wanted to talk about here is uh, and is that when we talk about going to Mars as an example, when we finally start heading in that direction, that we will find that astronauts will start to look to genetic modification for, as an example, um, a longevity of life, um, uh, uh, genetics that would... Um, support radiation exposure with less um, cancer, as an example. So when we look at going to interstellar space as a human crewed mission, we would expect, I would expect that most of those astronauts would be some type of superhuman, super genetically modified astronauts um, to be able to withstand what we're talking about doing. Um, and so uh, my point of view, again, you know, as we start a mission on a submarine, we, we, we we are assigned a mission. We don't maybe not know what it is. Um, we 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 start to line up. We gather food. We put it on board. We we put it in refrigerators. We put it in freezers. Our fresh food is gone right away. When you go out to sea, sometimes you have a band and you have people waving to you. Sometimes you don't. Um, when you go finally and you are submerged underwater, okay, everybody has to work together to do that. I remember one of my first times on a submarine that I did not line the valves right properly, closing and opening valves to allow the submarine to submerge when we had the, when we had that alarm to do so. Um, and the engineer was not happy with me because we were not able to submerge properly. Um, so those things of understanding how we do things um, would be um, uh, important for the safety of the rest of the crew. In other words, we all work together for the same goal. Um, we're all cross-trained so that we all have a purpose. 
and uh, we we go about doing our missions uh, in 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 a safe and respectful manner. Um, and I guess I'll I'll stop there. Thank you. All right, now to our in-person panelists. Uh, we're gonna start with Evie Kendall. Dr. Evie Kendall is an emerging technology bioethicist. I imagine a bioethicist of emerging technology. You're not yourself emerging. Uh, and, and, and public health scientist whose work focuses on reproductive biotechnologies, health communication and media and space ethics. She is currently senior lecturer of health promotion at Swinburne University of Technology in Victoria, Australia although currently you're at Yale doing some summer teaching. Um, and Evie's research interests include artificial womb technology, ethical issues in aerospace medicine, planetary defense, and public health education. Excellent. Thank you, Erica. And thank you for setting up this uh, wonderful panel for us. So we've had Aisha talk about selecting people for the mission. We've had Martha talking about what skills they're going to need during the mission. And of course, we've had Dan then talk about uh, the Noah's Ark idea, and I'm actually expanding on that idea as well. So I'm interested in what's happening on the other end of the actual travel. So we've picked the people, and now we're actually going to be establishing our society elsewhere. And usually people say we need to do this because one day we will need to save humanity. And my question is always, what do you mean by save, and what do you mean by humanity? So do we mean that any member of the species surviving is saving humanity, in which case it wouldn't matter necessarily who ended up surviving. Uh, we could have just any members of the species still living on elsewhere. That would be the survival of humanity. Or we might go a bit deeper, which is what I prefer to do, and think what, what's actually unique about us as a species, what's actually good. And we might look at our virtues or our values and things like our diversity, uh, our abilities, uh, if we value those, all these different things that make us unique as a species. And if we say that it's actually our values that we want to survive, then of course, one of the really important things to focus on is diversity and all the different types of people, the different types of humans that make up humanity and how we can save that diversity. So I'm a reproductive bioethicist, so I'm very concerned by the fact that when people talk about setting up a space community, they're often talking about making babies. How do we make sure we can make enough babies? We need the population growth. And again, the Noah's Ark idea is you then go and populate. And of course, it might sound uh, reasonable, but if we question it a little bit, we'll notice there's absolutely a risk of reproductive slavery, particularly for cisgendered women. So particularly concerned with the idea that uh, if we're in a situation where we are trying to save humanity by going off world, if you're told the only way that you can get a seat on Noah's Ark, our lifeboat example here in ethics, is to use your womb to make lots of babies, then of course, what happens if you change your mind? And Charles S. Cockle has that wonderful phrase about space being tyranny prone what if they say, well, your resources were dependent on you making the babies. That was your role. So now you don't get any oxygen. That's how that's going to go. As an ethicist and particularly reproductive bioethicist, I'm very concerned with that idea. I'm also concerned about the fact that that would be incredibly limiting on diversity. We'd be looking at only uh, physiologically reproductively available individuals here. So that would be discriminating against people who were older, uh, people who were not uh, able to reproduce biologically, and that might, of course, include people who are socially infertile. Uh, so those are all very important aspects of humanity, that diversity that we want to save. So how do we pick people to go on our Noah's Ark, our lifeboat? There are a number of different ways we could do it, and one of them is use a pay. If you can afford a seat on the boat, up you go. Now, my argument is that if the only parts of humanity that survive are the billionauts, that is an extinction level event. That is not the survival of humanity. It is definitely not the survival of the species. It is not the survival of our values. Uh, definitely not our diversity. But of course, that's also a very destructive subsection of our population if you look at the environment. If we want to survive as a species, we need people who collaborate and work together, as we've already heard other speakers say. So, okay, we're not going to have the reproductive slavery. We're not going to have the user pay system. I'm going to put those aside. 
Maybe we have a random lottery. We've got 100 places. Maybe that's the fairest, the most just way to do it. But what happens if we don't get a single doctor? This is a problem. We recognize this. What about a stratified random sample pool? We need X number of these skills and these skills and these skills, and we're going to categorize everyone, and then we're going to draw our random sample from there. But again, a lot of biases come into what do we value? Like I just said doctor. We all assume we want a doctor, but do we assume that we want a painter? Do we assume we need a botanist? Where are we going to draw, draw the line? Who's going to draw the line? What biases are going to come into that? And again, what diversity are we going to lose as a result? We also have the option of just saying, okay, there are certain inherent requirements of the job of being one of humanity's saviors on the boat. And one of those inherent requirements for some people might be that, that reproductive capability. So we'll say the same as you can't be hired as a surrogate if you can't have a baby. Same thing. We'll say, okay, you're humanity's surrogate. So your role is to make babies, but your role is to be a painter. Perhaps we're happy with that. Perhaps we think, actually, no, it's discriminatory to ask people about these uh, life choices and family plans. We don't do that with other jobs. Maybe we have to exclude those considerations, the same as we do with other work, and just hope for the best. Hope that we actually have enough people that will procreate for our project. And then, of course, we've got a points-based system. Maybe being reproductively capable gets you some points, but other factors get you other points, like those other roles, skills, jobs. Perhaps being a polyglot is going to be amazing because you're going to save the most human languages that way in your one spot on the boat. But again, what are we going to value? Who's going to make those choices? How are we going to stop uh, discrimination coming into that decision? So personally, I'm opting toward the random or the stratified random sample because I think if we can't preserve diversity and we can't preserve those values of equity, equality, that we haven't saved humanity anyway. So that's just my perspective there, but I am very open to alternative views there. Uh, but I will hand back over to Erica for now. Thank you. Last but not least, uh, AJ, I'm going to put my timer here so you can see it. Um, we have AJ Link, who received his JD from the, the George Washington University Law School and his LLM in Space Law at the University of Mississippi School of Law. <laughs> also, Michelle Hanlon, uh, you might notice, works there. Uh, he's the inaugural director of the Center for Air and Space Law Task Force on Inclusion, Diversity, and Equity in Aerospace and an adjunct professor of space law at Howard University School of Law. Uh, AJ is the communications director for Astro Access and works as a research director for the Judd Astra Project. I had to cut a lot of stuff out of this bio at this point. Um, AJ is a policy analyst for the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network and serves on several advisory boards and steering committees that focus on disability advocacy and broader social justice movements. And I added this, he's also a board member of my nonprofit, the Just Space Alliance, which advocates for a more ethical and inclusive future in space. Hey, y'all. This is AJ. I've got on a black hat and a black long sleeve shirt and a gold necklace with my wife's name on it. I would also add, because Michelle is sitting right there, that I'm a member of For All Mankind's uh, Institute for Ethics in Space. Uh, so I, I'm going to talk about accessibility uh, in a really roundabout way. We may not even talk about space. I want folks to think about the buildings they've been in this week and how accessible they've been for someone who needed to use a wheelchair or another mobility device. Um, I, want folks to, <laughs> I want folks to think about how many people in the room have worn glasses or are wearing glasses. And I want you to think about the disconnect about how we view wearing glasses as a normal thing and not an accommodation or an access need, but just something we are accustomed to. Um, and with that, uh, I, I would like to talk about how we need to design more accessible spaces. Um, and that's not just the stairs, right? That's not just the elevator. I want y'all to think about how many presentations we've seen over the past couple days. And we'll see where folks haven't described their slides for folks who maybe can't see them. Um, do we have an ASL interpreter in the room for people who needed that? Um, are we considering th these things? We have captions right now, uh, but they are machine learning captions. They're not actual cart. Um, are we designing our spaces and space to be accessible for everyone? Um, Erica was kind enough to mention Astro Access. I am no longer the communications director. I'm a former communications director, um, but I still do work with Astro Access. And how are we designing 
our spacecraft, um, our space environments? How are we hiring in terms of the space field with people who have access, experience, and knowledge? Um, I think about when we're talking about how we select the crew, it's not so much who we're selecting, but the questions we're ask, asking about how we're making it accessible for anyone who does want to go. Um, last night we talked about, um, or last night I, I, I did a poll, I don't know how many of you were there, but not everyone wants to go to space and that's cool, but some people do, some people don't. Um, but if someone wants to go, are we making it accessible for them? Uh, I, I think about you know how we again view disability. We're not going to go through a whole thing of disability theory, but you know there's a social model of disability. There's the medical model of disability. Do we only view disability as people having quote unquote impairments? Are they apparent impairments? Uh, impairments, right? There are lots of people with non-apparent disabilities. Like I am autistic. Most people who do not know me don't think of me as as a disabled person, but I identify as a capital D disabled person in the disabled community. Right? Disability is complex. Um, and, and this isn't to say that we have to have disabled crew members um, on, on this journey, uh, but we will. Um, and, you know, and going back to the social model of disability, space is a disabling environment. Um, I, I think it was um, Martha who talked about you know different types of mental health disabilities. I'm sure other folks have talked about it. Um, but the example that's been really poignant over the past couple of years is how some people did really well during COVID being isolated because that's what they like. I'm one of those people. Um, some people did really, really poorly because they're not used to being shut into tiny spaces and not being able to go and visit and, and meet people and, and have friends, things like that. Um, which type of person would be quote unquote best to be locked in a spaceship for 10 years, 20 years, right? When we think about the people who are most qualified, it is the one who's most jovial. You know, when you think about like I've had struggles um, until recently, like with interviews, I'm not great with eye contact. Um, I don't really, you know, do well in kind of that interpersonal setting sometimes. But that, does that mean I'm less qualified because I'm less friendly? Um, I, I think, you know, when we're we're imagining who is best, who is who is fittest, whatever word you want to use, who's the most right, we really have to expand the way we think about who 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 is is quote unquote best, but then also how we're designing our spaces for those folks. And are we designing our spaces for those folks to thrive? Like how many people have considered that maybe a blind person would be great in space with no light? You know, what about a deaf person who can communicate without having to speak if the comms go down? Like, are we really thinking about who is best suited for these types of disabling environments? Um, disabled people have been historically and currently really good at navigating spaces that aren't built for them, disabling spaces that don't want them there, that exclude them. And I think that kind of ingenuity is really important. Maybe you don't have to be disabled to learn that kind of ingenuity, um, but disabled people grow up in a world where they have to do that. And so for me, when we talk about how do we pick a crew, it's it's more how do we ask how we're designing, um, to, to Evie's point, an inclusive and accessible environment for the crew that most wants to go and be there and be part of whatever we decide to do. Um, I see that I'm close to my time, so I will stop there. I can talk about disability and accessibility for hours. I get paid to do that. So um, if you ever want to talk about it, let me know. Uh, but I appreciate y'all coming out. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you all for those fantastic talks. I almost feel spoiled that we get another half of this to, to have some conversation. Um, I have a question written down for each of you. I'm, I'm going to go through that. I also have a, a couple questions to the panel. Um, since I can see all of you, if any of you want to answer someone else's question and respond, um, just put your physical hand up. I don't think I have the ability to see the, the Zoom hand, so um, just, just indicate to me or poke me, whatever. whatever. Um, okay, um, Martha, I'll start with you. Um, what was the most unexpected lesson you learned from your experience with high seas? Uh, there were a few unexpected lessons learned. Um, I think one was just the importance of, of a common goal, uh, in, in crew, crew cohesion. So you kind of saw that as we approached the end of the mission, uh, when we had a really, you know, we, we kind of had a lot of, a few conflicts at the start where it's like, oh, you're all like new flatmates and you're just still figuring out like who's doing the dishes or something like that, like small stuff like that, but you get it started and it was fine. And we had almost no conflict for the six months after that until like the last six weeks 
it was almost as if you saw a switch flip in people's minds and they were no longer so concerned about the the crew missions and the their the relationships with the crew members they were now it started thinking okay this is what's coming up in six weeks when we get out and it, it, it's a challenging environment too because we have no internet we have no phone in six weeks we're going to be unemployed and homeless and there's nothing that you can do about it <laughs> so it, and, and and different people responded to that in different ways like myself and one other were like well again we're going to be unemployed and homeless so we're in no rush to get out and we'll just, you know, <laughs> so we're happy to stay in here. Whereas other people were like, you know, that family was coming to visit them. They were giving a Ted talk or something. And their pri- there was just a real shift in priorities and it caused a lot of conflict in the career. So that was, you know, we made it because we build up all the trust um, from the start of the mission. Uh, for me, I had to kind of dig deep and change my leadership style. I'm more of a lead from behind type person. Like everyone's very talented and, um, you know, would do their job better than I could ever tell them to do it. Um, but later in the mission, I had to really step up my, um, I guess, more direct management style and, and also be a real psychological support for everyone who needed it. So that was, it was kind of me also upping my, I called it my mom game. So it was good to know that I have that mom game in me and that I can emotionally support everyone. But I was like, it's not, it's not sustainable for a long term. It was okay because it was six weeks. So that, those were a couple of the big takeaways at the end of the mission and, and that importance of a common goal. I think that's interesting because I I, uh, I personally research and write a lot about the different motivations for space settlement. And I hadn't thought about how those different motivations amongst individuals on a crew could could cause conflict. So that's a, that's a great point. Um, Aisha, so uh, you have a, a lot of background in education. And Dan mentioned cross-training, which is also something I'm, I'm very interested in. Um, and to me, it seems like one of the most important types of skills that we should have isn't necessarily being a doctor or a dentist or being able to run the nuclear plant, but just being a good teacher, since no matter what, we'll need to keep uh, passing those skills forward through the generations. So do you have any thoughts on that, on the importance of including teachers? Ooh, that's a great one. Well... You know, I would really choose a teacher that's had a lot of intercultural experience, values that, maybe is diverse themselves. Um, I worked in a lot of international schools and I felt like I kept saying, seeing the same teacher over and over and over and over again. And that really put in play a lot of interesting dynamics. I think that there's a lot that's unspoken with who you choose as your teacher. Our kids seeing themselves in the teacher, the teachers um, looking at diversity, neurodiversity, you know, is this person neurodiverse? That's something that I'd love to see because then we can also show kids that this is how I, how I differentiate for myself. And it's not something that's hidden, but something that's out there. In terms of cross training, I love that. I think that there's so many careers that bleed into each other and we can be really rigid about like putting a box and a PhD around it. So (laughs) I know so many people who've gone down the path of education only to be like, but I really love doing this thing. Um, And so I think that being really open to education, being holistic would be important. I would also really want to bring in traditional forms of education, right? Really looking at how different cultures teach their young and, you know, bringing in, yeah, just traditional forms of education would be very interesting to see off planet as well. Thank you. Um, So Dan, um, you brought up some really good points about potentially bringing along non-human crew members, whether that includes robots or some kind of uh, genetically altered humans. And I'm wondering what you what you think about the importance of making sure we include non-human life uh, on these missions. Do we, uh, th- there's a certain amount of we need to make sure we're bringing plants for crops, but also uh, perhaps for psychological purposes. And I'm always wondering if we're going to end up bringing cats along to take care of the rat problem in storage or, or bring dogs along. Um, so, so do you have any thoughts on that, especially as someone who worked in a submarine where there, there wasn't a lot of uh, non-human life along? 
Okay, so you you broke up on me, so I I did catch most of that, but I'm, I'm thinking you are you're you're heading in the direction of like embryos and um, maybe um, robots and uh, artificial. About um, uh, whether you think we should include uh, plants and animals as as well as humans and robots. Yes. Okay. So you know there was some thoughts about you know, how you would take, um, well, first of all, you know, the animals and plants are um, a part of uh, who we are. So, you know, it would be kind of bland, right? Okay, you, you th think about this on a submarine, there, there's there's no plants on a submarine. Uh, there are no animals on a submarine. So it's all about work, you know, and we, we went about doing work, which we, we had, this is how this happens on a submarine. We did eight hours of work. You slept for eight hours, and then you were you were doing maintenance and for eight hours. You were doing things to qualify to cross train for those other other things that you needed to do. So th that's that is kind of how um, you know that works uh, uh, without the ability to to see, touch, and feel plants or animals. Um, that is a um, um, that is. Uh, for a long duration flight, you know, you're still, you gotta you gotta have those kinds of things, right? Um, so that's something you need to plan for. But also, um, you know, you need plants to be able to to do things like to make water, to make oxygen, to be able to um, to um, you know to grow different kinds of food. So um, you need you need that biological mechanism that we find on Earth through microbes and soil and plant growth and uh, to be able to um, to do what we need to have long long term, um, so yeah, I definitely agree. We have to have some type of uh, ability to think about plants and animals as we go uh, into space. Uh, thank you, and I think Martha had something that she wanted to add as well. Oh, I, I was just going to say, like we do, we did have plants and an animal actually on the high seas mission, and they do have plants on the space station too. I think you know. It's recognized that it's it's psychologically necessary, um, and uh, you know the closer that we can get to sustainability, um, you know the more success I think your mission will have. And I don't we don't hit sustainability without having plants and animals with us. We're part of we're part of an ecosystem, so it's we can't remove ourselves from nature. We're part of nature, and so I think that's uh, an important aspect of it too. So yeah, great point. Thank you, um, Evie. How much do we need to think about genetic diversity? And how, more importantly, do we balance these concerns about population genetic health with the ever-present threat of eugenics arguments? Yeah, I mean, give me an easy question. I mean, <laughs> just, just real quickly, 30 yeah, seconds yeah, to 30 cover seconds. it. Yeah, uh, Totally easy. Uh, so we've had a few people bring up genetic engineering potentially uh, to allow us to better survive in uh, what is an environment that's quite hostile to our survival. Uh, so people are usually on one of two camps in space ethics. It's either space is fragile, let's not hurt us, or space is hostile, it wants to kill us. And the reality is actually both of these things. Uh, so in the genetic engineering element, uh, the concern is, of course, that eugenics, that specter of, you know, we're going to have this genetic have and have nots, we're going to have a genetic arms race and everyone's going to be 10 feet tall, uh, that kind of issue. And I guess it's a little bit encouraging to think that if some of these engineering projects are done exclusively for uh, interstellar missions or for use in space, they're less likely to lead to that sort of widespread issue on Earth. Because a lot of what you'd be engineering to survive in space simply isn't actually that helpful here. Uh, so there wouldn't be that huge demand for it. But it is still a concern. We wouldn't want to have a society where everyone is essentially the same. Because that's actually bad for the survival of a species. It, when everything uh, becomes too close genetically, it's obviously not good for survival. But psychologically, it's also bad. And if we end up engineering out some of that diversity, particularly things that in some contexts are considered disabling, but in other contexts are actually really valuable, we actually lose a lot of skill uh, in, our, in our sort of base of, of surviving humans. So the concern there is, of course, we'd have to have very clear ideas of what we want to make sure that it didn't lead to discrimination, partly because no matter what we do to try and homogenize a group of humans, 
the next generation, that diversity starts coming back in. Uh, so if, for example, we decide we're not going to have any same-sex attracted people on our lifeboat, the next generation, we're going to have queer people. That's how it works. Um, but do you really want those, those children born into a, an, a hostile society that tried to select them out? And I would say, no, that's actually really bad for the survival of a group that really need to be collaborating. So I would say the diversity genetically is actually something we want to retain, not just because it's good for you know, anti-discrimination, but because it's actually valuable in and of itself. The species is stronger when it has more diversity. So I'm not opposed necessarily to engineering some protective factors for like radio resistance, um, but of course there are limits to what we can actually do and the, the difference is probably not going to be that huge. Uh, but that kind of thing, if you can make a really good case for why it's protective and why it would enhance survival, particularly for the next generation that didn't consent to being born into that hostile environment, perhaps we do owe them some protection uh, for that environment. Uh, but in terms of do we want everyone to be the same, I'd say absolutely not. And again, that would be an extinction event for humanity uh, if we lose that uniqueness that we have. Okay, if I add something? Absolutely. This is AJ. And I think one of the things that I work in, not with modifications, but with technology, is this idea of techno chauvinism and, you know, a product with that is techno ableism and that technology can cure or fix disabilities or problems and that that is the solution. And it's always the technological way of quote unquote fixing things. And, you know, to your point, I feel like that is very much in line with the idea of eugenics and that. Either you get the technological fix or you're easily discarded. And I think that's something we definitely need to be concerned about. So that actually leads into a question I wanted to ask you, AJ. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, no, that's perfect. Thank you for the good setup. Um, so you you made some excellent points about um, disabled people uh, being particularly well suited to certain scenarios in space and that, that uh, keeping them out um, is, is preventing us. Um, from from having a lot of, of really qualified crew members for that reason. Um, but you also have, have talked and, and written about um, the importance of designing for accessibility um, as, as part of being more inclusive of disabled people in space. Um, but I also assume that designing more accessible space habitats, space technologies is going to be more effective for everyone, all crew members, right? Yeah, a diversity of these technologies, in fact, will improve our options. Is, is that uh, something you thought about as well? This is AJ. Thank you for that great leading question. There's this thing called universal design. So yeah, I, I, I think it's, it's really important that first we educate folks about accessibility and universal design, because for a lot of people, that is an unfamiliar term or an unfamiliar idea in terms of broad accessibility and the right to access things. But when you think about some of the amazing accessibility things that have been created that we use today, like easy grip things in the shower or something like that, where it's designed for people who had mobility issues, right? The, the example that lots of folks like to use is curb cuts and the, the curb cut effect and how most people who use the curb cuts aren't actual wheelchair users. Um, but something that I like to use instead, um, even though I hate them, is closed captions. Most of the people in my life love watching whatever show they're watching with closed captions. Um, and it just does not sit right with me. It, it's really frustrating for me. But that was something that was designed for you know, folks who, who couldn't hear or you know, had audio processing or whatever. Uh, but lots of people use it. And so to your point, when we design to include more folks, it gets utilized by people who we wouldn't necessarily think of as needing or wanting it. And I think as someone who works in accessibility and with access needs, a lot of people don't know that there are lots of things that would make their life easier and more accessible, and they don't know that they can ask for them. And so I think when we design those spaces from the beginning, because it's a lot, a lot cheaper to design them for accessibility from the beginning than to retrofit them. Um, we open up just a whole, a whole. I don't even know the word cornucopia. Maybe, maybe that's the wrong word. Of possibilities of of how people can be in space and you know being being more or better or different, whatever word you want to use, than they are now. Again, like space is disabling, but it also can be enabling for some folks who are disabled by the environment here on Earth because. Space is disabling for some folks, but like Earth is Earth is disabling for other folks, right? And so 
part of the science and the exploration and diversity is figuring out how space impacts all different kinds of body minds. You know, whether that's people who are dealing with anxiety and depression, maybe those folks aren't best for space. Maybe they are. I don't know. I'm not going to to say something like that. Um, what about folks who have different uh, mobility disabilities, like people who are paralyzed? Is space better or worse for them? Is it helpful to them? What does that do to their bodies and their physiologies? I think all of these questions are pretty unanswered, uh, and you can't really answer them if you exclude disabled folks from going to space at all. Thank you very much. I think Evie, that. Evie has a comment. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I think it is another thing where even if we say we're going to exclude certain disabilities, you can't because the next generation, these things are going to reappear. And obviously, if we're working in a space environment, people are going to lose their limbs. Accidents are going to happen. And I want the expert who's been living with, you know, just one arm their whole life to help that new person adapt to their uh, situation. Like I want that expertise in my group of people. So I need the experts who have this ability uh, to work around, as you've said, these disabling spaces, uh, because obviously we need to support people who become disabled or have accidents that may, may limit other skills that they, they previously had physically. And keeping in mind, we often think like our best candidate is someone who we use that term able-bodied, but, you know, one less leg is less mass, like it is. Uh, so we have to think about these these things in different ways. Uh, so, yeah, just adding that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I'm going to open it up for audience questions. Do I have the use of those wonderful volunteers with microphones? Yes, I see them in the back. And if our Zoom participants can't hear, I'll repeat the question. There are a few hands. I can take the rest of this off. There's plenty of yes. Well, it's better than not. Pop. Everybody just but stares at us. Yeah. I have a I have a question for Pip. I have a question for Dan. Um, from your experience working on a submarine, uh, maybe you witnessed it, maybe you haven't. What happens when critical supplies are low, like let's say food and medicine, and there's many sick people and many people starving, what happens? Would you say humans turn on each other? Uh-oh, we can't hear you, Dan. Is on the submarine? Is that what it was? He he was saying what ha whether you've seen this or not. If if uh, on a submarine something critical supplies run out, like food or medicine, what happens in that scenario? Do people turn on each other? Um, have you have you seen this scenario? Uh, so okay, so when we run low on critical supplies. Um, I think that, you know, there were times where, you know, obviously I was in engineering space that wasn't operations, but um, I remember that we surfaced once and we were able to take supplies from another, uh, I, I believe it was a ship at the time. So we were able to resupply um, in the middle of the ocean somewhere. So we, we weren't able to abort the, the mission completely. Um, but when it comes to medicines, they, there's no, there's no doctor on a submarine. Right, so you have them on. You might have them in aircraft carriers, right? But not on a submarine. So uh, what we know, I remember we had to, we somebody that was uh, hurting really bad. I think they had uh, some type of kidney infection. What we did was we just we put them in the birthing wrap, and then we strapped them into the birthing wrap. Um, believe it or not, because the uh, you know the submarines they they go in all the different kinds of directions, and so uh, you if you don't strap people in, you'll you'll fall out. So um, when it comes to when it comes to medicines and critical supplies, uh, if you're out of food, you're out of food. Uh, you 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 have no choice. You have to come back in. But I have to tell you that um, you know it, we we could ration. I mean so. Uh, if we knew that we had an extended mission of some sort, um, it would be, you know, the captain would say, look, everybody, your, you know, your rations are cut down to a, a quarter. Um, so whatever it would be to make the mission, is, that's what we would do. Uh, there would be no doubt about that. We would not abort a mission because we're out of sort. You know, that, that, that wouldn't happen. Thank you. Uh, 
Uh, hello. So, um, more like in lines of what an actual society or like how, like what would the command structure be of an interstellar mission with like a hundred people or so? Cause we talk about trying to enhance our odds of survival with, you know, selective, like, um, genetic modifications, but would you have all these diverse people and everything like that, different views, different opinions. Um, I'm, I'm assuming like more akin to the submarine experience would just having like strict like martial law be better or like what do you what do we think the command structure of such a mission would look like i'm actually curious to hear what martha in particular uh has to say about this martha did you hear that question yeah but the command structure yeah so that that's an interesting question um we had um like we, when we went on this national outdoor leadership school trip we we had a question at the end like one of the fellows was older. He wasn't doing so great. Uh, and there was, you know, an option of like camping near the road, kind of where we were to get out in the morning easily. Um, but it was an area we weren't supposed to be in or going back like, you know, a kilometer or two into the forest and camping where we should, but the fellow was kind of injured. And um, I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm not American, but most of the people there were. So they put it to a vote, majority rules, we go back into the forest. and. That was interesting um, because, you know, there's a lot of different ways to do democracy, to do leadership, to come to those big decisions. And um, I'd be more, where I live in Nunavut, uh, we don't have political parties and they're run by consensus government. That is another form of democracy where you have to come to a consensus on a decision uh, before you make a move. So if we were going by like a more consensus decision, uh, in uh, in that situation, we would have stayed put and taken like the weakest members considerations into account. Uh, and that's and I really like that's that's more my style of leadership to make sure that everyone's taken care of, we're on the right track, we're moving in the right direction. If someone needs help, I'll help them out and you know kind of continue in that direction. So uh, in that sense, those are both two two forms of democracy, right? I, and I think. Um, I guess getting back to your, what a command structure could look like, I think it depends on um, the team and what, what you're working with. I, I kept thinking like how different the mission would have been if one person on that team had been different and how it, it would have required a different management style. Uh, so there's, I think there's a couple of things um, to take into consideration when you're deciding uh, with a military mission, say on the submarine, you need it to be very top down because you, you know, the decisions are being made somewhere else. You don't have any agency. You just need to follow orders, right? So you need a very top-down structure where people are, you know, have bought into that. Whereas on this mission, you're not going to get any help, right? You're out there on your own. There's no, there's no help coming from Earth. You are going to run into situations that they've never thought of before. And you are, as a team, are going to have to come up with a way to overcome those challenges. So I think personally in... Um, this sort of mission, you would need a more democratic structure where you're taking into account a lot of different opinions. Like that's the whole point of bringing a diverse crew with you on that mission is so you can look at things from different angles that you haven't thought of and um, avoid things like groupthink and things like that. So I would consider some kind of democracy tending towards, um, you know, more of a consensus government style and again, one of the things I, I did on my crew, and which Dan kind of alluded to too, is that people will wear multiple hats. When you have um, when you have such a small team, you know you're going to burn out if you're a nurse for a hundred years or something, right? You're going to need you're going to need to take time out to like be the gardener for a while, and someone else can be the work, be the nurse for a while. And and that goes for your leaders too. It's something we didn't really do on my mission, but having um, you know giving that person you know having a succession plan, like what, what if you pass away? Like what's the next step? So having a succession plan, sharing the leadership and having kind of a more democratic way of overcoming obstacles that will come up and, and you guys are all you've got out there. So that, that's kind of my two cents on that. Uh, yeah, real quick, I'll just say, I think you make a great point about the importance of building retirement into your system as well. Go ahead, AJ. Yeah, this is AJ. I don't want to add too much law into this, but there is a right to self-determination, and eventually we have to let those folks decide how they want to govern themselves. Um, so I think for us to 
say what what is best without being there you know thinking ahead is kind of arrogant of us um and, and it's not for us to decide for them thank you i have a very simple question um are you aware um at the latest round of the european astronaut selection they have a disability a disabled astronaut selected Yes, but it's very narrow, and I do not like the coverage of it because it's a very, very small slice of what disabled people are and can be. I think for ESA, it is um, little people, people with a missing limb, and I, different. Yeah. yeah, so it's a very narrow subset of disability. Uh, so in case anyone else is not aware of your uh, what they're calling the right. Which we don't care. <laughs> Don't use euphemisms for disability. It's okay to say disabled. But they are trying to investigate very, very early uh, form of investigation of uh, what they would need to do by a disabled astronaut. I'll also recommend Astro Access if you're interested. I appreciate that plot. Thank you. Thank you. Got it. I, uh, I'm really asking this question for Grant Anderson of Paragon Space, who couldn't be here. Uh, Paragon, of course, built life support for International Space Station. They've now got the contract for Lunar Gateway. Uh, and he asks questions for any long-duration space mission, uh, Mars, outer planets, but certainly interstellar. What do you do with the bodies? The, the question, I think... Uh... I fi plug for a series by Mary Robin at Kowal called the Lady Astronaut Trilogy, uh, where she addresses the the horrors of NASA's previous plans for that, that uh, the answering that question. But um, I'll just throw this open to anyone. Would anyone like to comment on uh, a good practical answer or just uh, just general thoughts on the idea of how will we handle body disposal uh, in space? I see a great hand right there. Both uh, practically and, and socially. I think someone in the audience has an answer. Do you want to answer? Yeah. Um, I was thinking that it would be useful to do something where, like, after you honor them with a funeral and everything, like, that's nice, but, like, to somehow recycle them. So, like, it, like there's a lot of water in their body that can be used, and there's a lot of other, like, nutrients that can be used for plants and stuff. So, eventually, just um, sort of, like, recycle them or compost them. Uh, the gentleman makes an excellent point, which is that uh, everything will need to be recycled in space, especially the organic components, which is which is what we're made of. Um, and in fact, that's how it works on Earth. We recycle our organic components. It's just that the distance between our dead loved ones and our next meal is a lot longer on Earth okay. than perhaps it will be in space. Um, any any comments from the panel? Uh, Aisha, I think, uh, had her hand up. Um, I think there's going to be need to build in some autonomy here too and have choice because this ties in really strongly to people's belief systems usually. Um, so of course, safety is always a concern. And, and so I think that we would hopefully as a crew and also our engineers come up with a few different methods and ways and, and they would probably tie into belief systems. Yeah, this is AJ. I would just add that there may be new belief systems too and new customs mm -hmm. and new ways of honoring people who die not on earth, I guess. Um, Dan, I, I know you're having some audio trouble. I don't know if you're following this part of the conversation, but um, since... Yeah, since yeah you know, <laughs> you know what happens in a, on a submarine, right? So if someone dies, our procedure is to put them in the refrigerator, right? Um, and um, And then depending on the seriousness of the mission, um, uh, we would not abort um, because of death, um, but um, obviously we'd go to port as fast as possible um, based on the mission. Uh, Dan, I'm also wondering if you'd um, be willing to talk about the concerns that different cultures have for burial of remains, uh, because I've heard you speak at conferences before about the problems with the moon and the... Uh, the sending of Eugene Shoemaker's ashes to the moon and the concerns among indigenous communities about that. Uh, did you want to speak on that at all? 
Okay, so um, indigenous aspects of the moon, and and well, first going back to death. Obviously, you know, Aisha brought this up about, um, you know, cultural respect as an example. Um, you know, we have different belief systems, um, but going back to the idea here it's from the very beginning. So when you sign on, when you sign on to this hundred person uh, crew, um, this Noah's Ark, you're signing on to a mission. Everybody knows what the mission is before they before they hop on board, right? Uh, it's the same thing with a submarine. When you sign up to go into the military, you sign up for a specific purpose. You're signed in for that mission. Um, so when it comes to command structure, you know what the command structure is. It's about the mission and everybody coming together on the same page to complete that mission, whatever that would be, right? So that would be upfront. Um, but when it comes to um, the ideas of the moon, right? So we're going to the moon to mine the moon. We're going to the moon as Artemis to 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 have a permanent presence on the moon and Mars, right? And uh, beyond Earth. So from the indigenous point of view, obviously we shouldn't go to the moon unless we have the necessary responsibility to go there for a reason, right? But from my from my point of view. Um, you know, uh, especially from the lunar surface innovation consortium side of things. Um, if we are there, if you have indigenous people on the moon, right? So we're physically there. We have the ability then to to monitor what is happening. And then we have the ability to have say in what is being done. And in other words, to have things that are being done in a respectful way. In other words, if you're mining the moon, you're just not polluting the moon. Uh, you're not creating debris on the moon just for for the sake of creating debris because you can because no one can see it um, from Earth as an example. But so the idea is about being ethical where your feet are. So wherever your feet are, that's where the ethics be, that's where the ethics must start. Um, and it, and that's kind of how I I see that as if we're there, we have the ability to have say. If we're not at the space table, we have no say. Uh, so it's all about being able to have that ability to 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 have a voice right sometimes when you're indigenous and you're 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 you you have a disability or you're just a person with disability as an example it's all about having a voice so we have to have that voice thank you uh next question over wait uh someone with the microphone the person in the front has had their hand up for a while but let me go back here first and then and then we'll go to you so back here first Hi, thanks. Um, so in listening to this whole discussion about how we can have a um, the full gamut of the human experience up in space, which is what we would want, right? And to have the full uh, gamut of a better society up there. It sounds to me like the real crux of it is we need to increase the ability to get people up there and get people to all these locations. I, I Would you agree that that's kind of the linchpin to all of it? Because when we look at these tiny missions you can compare Apollo to the first missions to the South Pole. Um, nowadays, the, the everyone on the South Pole, we have thousands of people of every um, creed, race, color, and type you can imagine, religion, and now we're getting the full gamut that you're all talking about. And I, it seems to me that that's what it really comes down to, is we have to move on from Shackleton to McMurdo. So does anyone have a response to that, the, the argument that... Uh capacity is our problem right now and if we have a more of a capacity we'll have more representation in space uh, any thoughts on that the mic is on now there we go thank you so i don't know that we have to increase capacity right now i don't think we have to do things right now i think we can be very intentional the universe has existed for a little bit of time. I think it will continue to exist for a little bit of time. It's not, you know, something that we have to experience before it goes away. And so eventually, yes, we do need to be able to have all different kinds of people in a vast number and quantity, but I don't think it's something that we have to do immediately right now. I think we can we can be very intentional and thoughtful about how and when we do it. Any other comments from the panelists? Okay. Can, can you can you say uh, what the the question might be again? Yes. So he said that. Uh, let me rephrase uh, on your behalf. He was saying that he he wonders if increasing the number of people going to space by a large degree would help address some of these problems of inclusion, um, because so far we've had so few 
people go to space. Okay, I, I may not have caught all of that, but what I wanted to say regarding our orbital space, our orbital space right now is we, we know we have orbital debris is getting, you know, it's getting worse, right? So we're, we're launching more, we're putting more orbital debris up. So my position on that is as an example that uh, being Native American, by the time that we have the ability to create our own space program, our own ability to have uh, our own constellation of satellites, the carrying capacity of our orbital space will be decreased and we may not have the access uh, to space as we normally would. In other words, we're going into space at a time that there's uh, increasing debris, which limits our access, which becomes a social justice issue and becomes an environmental racism, racism issue in our orbital space. Uh, so it's not just Native Americans, it's First Nations people in Canada, it's, it's other Indigenous people around the world that are facing the same environmental uh, justice issue if they are wanting to go to space and they don't have the ability to do so under increasing um, debris capability. Thank you, Dan. And Ayesha, you had your hand up. But you're muted. Sorry. Um, I would be hesitant to send large groups out to learn lessons that we can learn on Earth um, just because of what that would mean for the individual, right? I know that Astro Axis is also doing some wonderful things with zero-G flights um, and putting purposeful, you know, supports in before flights, talking to people after, things like that. So I wouldn't say that we necessarily need to take that grand a step to, to understand how to have some universal design built in. Uh, I'll also say that I feel like your argument is a, a bit like trickle down space access, which is just, uh, you know, if we increase the numbers, that doesn't change the, the ratios, the proportions of the, the kinds of people that are going. And so I think it, it'll be a combination of more people and also more deliberate inclusion uh, to solve a lot of these problems. Um, and in the front, waiting patiently. You define toxic personalities. Do you want Charles Manson on board? Do you want Vladimir Putin on board? Um, do you want a pervert um, manipulator? However, you define those. And where do you, and, and we probably all carry some of those toxic traits. And so, have you, I mean, any member, I mean, on a submarine, on a, on a mission, have you considered how to, to filter out or, or, or do you accept that? such people will be on board and how do you or how do you weed them out how do we how do we select out uh toxic personalities harmful yeah uh we don't because we can't and so i mean the the most recent paper i read on the rate of psychopathy said they're now estimating one in 22 count the people in the room right now and I mean, realistically, um, psychopaths have contributed a great deal to society in a variety of different ways. Um, so obviously some of the toxic personality traits, as you very correctly say, we all have. Um, like uh, all of us have some degree of selfishness and narcissism, I would argue. And of course, that is very toxic in the situation that we're specifically describing here. So I think it also links to the what kind of command structure do we have? I mean... Essentially, you can have the best idea that we're going to have like a deliberative democracy. But if that society develops in another direction, that's just the direction that it develops organically. So you might have the second or third or fourth generation of that community say, actually, no, we, we don't want this particular command structure. We want something else. And we could even have things like, actually, you know, these, these ca characteristics that we thought were really toxic on earth or under certain conditions we can actually manage them in a different way. Uh, so we can sort of tease out the contributions that each of these individuals can make. Because uh, keep in mind, of course, the vast majority of psychopaths are actually living very productive lives. Uh, it's a very specific uh, subset that will end up in any sort of violent encounter. Uh, and I would say a lot of that is environmental. So we can actually intervene more on that environmental side. Uh, we can actually have a more supportive uh, environment to try and uh, sort of socialize people in different ways. But the reality is we have to accept that human beings are flawed and groups of human beings just magnify those flaws. Uh, so we have to have a system that can actually adapt to that. Because even if we select it out in the first generation, again, it's coming back. <laughs> uh, so we have to have a way to sort of deal with that. Uh, as we do in all current human societies, we don't do it perfectly. 
Um, but we do have systems where we punish people who are not behaving in a way that's um, acceptable to that particular social group at that particular time. And those laws and those punishments change over time as those societies actually change, for better or worse. But again, it's not unique to this uh, scenario, so I don't think we can filter it out. Uh, I think we just have to accept that it will be there and do very similar things to what we've done on Earth where these things are existing as well. Yeah. Uh, actually, M Martha had her hand up next. Thank you. I think it comes a little bit back to um, the goal. Why are we going as well? Like... Some people are assuming there will be a second generation, whereas I kind of assume, no, that's it. Those 100 people are it, and there is no second generation. So the psychological aspect of that is really important in the selection. And so maybe you will be able to select the toxic personalities or something, but there is no second generation. It was a one-off shot. And that kind of comes to the goal of the mission. Is your mission to like save humanity and colonize a planet, which is a bit loaded, but um, or is it just to make contact be like this is this is the story of humanity and we just wanted to come and see and 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 that's that's that and we're done so i think that it's kind of like what is the goal of this mission as well um but i i totally agree like you can't human human personality is human personality and it's going to develop differently under different pressures and you don't know that until you get to that pressure so yeah aj yeah this is aj i would just add that i agree uh, with both of you that you probably can't filter, but any attempt to do so would definitely be extremely loaded with ableism, insanism, and which mind is the right kind of mind to have and which mind is the wrong kind of mind to have. And I think opening up that kind of evaluation, if you want to call it that, would be just incredibly discriminatory to all different types of minds besides the ones we would hypothetically want to exclude. So I'm going to take... Like Wait. I would like yes, to add one something, you know, yes. you know, because, you know, uh, being in the Navy, you know, I, I threw a lot of garbage overboard on, on the tender, you know, just bags and bags and bags and stuff out in the ocean, right? So, um, and it's the same thing on the submarine. We ejected it to the bottom of the ocean of garbage, right? So it's very harmful. But what I, what I was getting at here is that when we go into space, we're looking at you know, even whether it's the moon or Mars, um, it's like... Well, no, no, no. We did that on Earth, and we're not going to do that. We're we're not going to pollute the ocean. We're not going to eject our garbage out in the middle of space, right? We're not going to we're not going to do the bad things that we did on Earth here. We're going to start over. We're going to have it. It's going to be a fresh start, right? Um, so um, I think that's that's kind of how you know that's 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 Noah's heart kind of ideas. Like you know, come out, do things differently that we don't want to do that we know aren't. Earth in some way that we don't want to do that again. We don't want that repeat of the things. So how do we go about doing only good things? Thank you, Dan. Um, I'm going to take the moderator's prerogative and ask the last question, uh, which is... I, I don't think we have time. I'm sorry. Uh, there were so many questions. I, I know we could, we could keep going on. Oh, that's a good point. All right. Who is... Who is uh, this, this lady right here. Special request. Thank you. Thank you. So we actually know that in space, human psychology changes. We know from the astronauts on the ISS um, and from other missions in space. So whatever we think that someone um, like me, Anna Maria, has this personality here on Earth, it might change in space. Also because our physiology changes and the uh, way the brain chemicals work and so on. That's one thing. And the second thing is that also during a lifetime, our personalities change. So in, in getting all these into perspective, I think personally that um, looking exclusively into psychology and how teams would work just based on psychology might be a um, faulty assumption to go with to start with uh, in, uh, in this uh, respect. So I was wondering if you have any comments on that. I don't know if AJ's mic was on, but he thinks you're right. Um, yeah. any, any comments from the panel on that? The idea that, uh, that our, even if we select very carefully based on psychology, our psychology will change during our lives. Uh, Martha, I think you had your hand up. Oh, yeah, I couldn't hear the question, but thank you for repeating. So. I certainly, yeah, your psychology will change over the course of your life. Um, but I, I also feel like kind of like 
you're most people are kind of set have a personality and kind of gets a little bit set i think it helps you know when people are self-aware and you know trying to become the best person that they can be um yeah but i think and i think things like the high seas mission where you put people under um stressful environments outside their comfort zone you get you kind of get to a sense to how people react to different situations so while it's like yeah our personalities do develop over the course of our lives um like you do have personality and it is somewhat somewhat fixed maybe it develops a bit but it, i i do think that you can see how a team would could work um you can you can practice that here on earth you can see how you operate as a team um and and figure out different strategies for overcoming conflict and um so i i do think that you know maybe you can't screen for everything but you can see how you do as a team and you can see how you do overcome conflicts or challenges and support each other when when people do have those breakdowns but yeah i also suspect the psychologists will enjoy studying decades worth of of team dynamics uh, once once we get there all right so now i'm going to take the moderator's prerogative since i was told what's that i was just going to say you have to think about the trauma the people trauma change with trauma yeah um I was told we had the full 90 minutes, so we have a couple minutes le left for this last question, which is, um, why is it worth having these conversations now, besides that I asked you all very nicely, um, what can thinking about crew selection for a 100-person interstellar mission, what can that help us figure out about who should be included in space work today? Who wants to go first? I can start. Go for it, Dan. I got stuck. Okay, so, you know, Artemis right now, we're looking at going to the moon and Mars to stay, right? So consider Mars being this, this uh, the original, this initiation of this 100 um, Noah's Ark crew kind of concept, right? So I mentioned earlier about, you know, robots, um, artificial intelligence, um, you know, superhumans, uh, our genetic uh, uh, changing of basically designer astronauts. When we talk about education, as Aisha, Aisha may say, like we talk about education, we should, well, so we're looking at an astronaut school, right? An astronaut training school. You, you, you should, this, this astronaut should be able to do six different things really, really well, right? And so we need to look at cross training astronaut schools uh, for, for, for different uh, 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 occupations, as you want to call that. So that's kind of how I see it is that, you know, this conversation, is relevant for how we think about how putting astronauts on Mars, which we're talking about, right? So it's not that far off. Today, today is the the day we need to do that. That's great. Anyone else? Uh, let's go with Evie next. Yeah. So change is really hard, and humans are really bad at it. And at the moment, we don't have a status quo to fight against. So we're in this really unique sort of window of time where we can say this is what we want. But just touching on some of the fantastic contributions from the audience, we heard about what do you do with a body and do we need to recycle the parts? And the reality is, as we've heard, we do that here, but people do have a choice. You can choose to be an organ donor or choose not to be an organ donor. You can choose to be buried or cremated. Now, we may not have the full suite of options in our, our space travel, but if we've already got a system and we've discussed it and we've come to some sort of consensus then people can choose whether or not space is for them based on that information. So if you have a belief where, for example, you have to be buried intact in soil from where you were born, then obviously that's not going to be available to you and you'll have to know that up front and make an autonomous decision what's more important to you personally, what is better for your personality, your values, etc. cetera. Uh, so you can actually retain some of that, have that informed consent about how you want to live your life and what you think a good life is but not if we don't have any structures. So people just go up there with no idea how their body is going to be treated uh, in advance of it happening. So I think we can uh, make some of these decisions without having to fight against, uh, you know, generation upon generation of status quo bias uh, toward how it's always been or how some people choose to believe that it's always been, which is usually what's happening. So I think it is a unique opportunity. It's, it's time limited and it's something that people are inspired by. Space inspires people to try and collaborate, which I think is actually really special. Uh, thank you. And Aisha, I'm going to give you the last word on this question. Okay, thank you so much. So if we consider space to be the commons belonging to everyone, then this conversation belongs to everyone. 
And I would say the next time we gather, everyone here who's, who's been, you know, asked to be on the panel, and we've thought about this a lot. I think about it almost every day. I'm actively doing it. My hands are dirty. It's beautiful. But I'd like to see some other folks who haven't had the privilege to be asked to talk about it yet, right? Or even people who haven't thought about it. I live in Egypt, and it's a place where space is for others. The conversation is for others. So people don't even enter into it. When I tell people what I do, people think I'm saying, like, Spain, not space. I'm sending people to Spain because it's a lot more tangible and realistic. So just opening this conversation around the world, we would learn so much, especially from traditional, you know, lens of, and, and I can't wait until we get there. So I would really urge and hope that we can start an international discourse on this as well. Thank you very much, Aisha. Uh, please, everyone join me in offering our deep gratitude to my amazing panelists. And thank you all too. Uh, AJ, I know you, as you mentioned, you don't like uh, captioning, but I think there's something you like even less, and that's seeing all your words attributed to a middle-aged bald guy. So, Not to look at the captions. <laughs> okay, we'll get that. We'll get that fixed. So, uh, yeah, it's time for a poster session, but let's just uh, also thank Erica one more time for just assembling this incredible panel of experts. Thank you.